All right. I'm Rue. And I'm Janelle. And this is episode seven of Cocktails and Compliance, and we are live from NAMA in Washington, D.C. <laughs> So we are excited to have special guests with us today because normally you would just have to listen to Rue and I for 45 minutes. So we are thrilled to have Jennifer Wood with us. She is vice president of the John Stewart Company. We have Anthony Sandoval, who is president and CEO of WSH Management. And we have Peter Lewis, who is executive vice president of property management at the Shocket Company. And I just want to thank Peter for taking a stop off your world tour uh, to join us. Because if any of you are connected to Peter on Facebook, for me, every time I log in, it's like playing an episode of Where in the World is Peter Lewis. So I appreciate you taking a break and joining us. Uh, so as always, we introduce our cocktail of the day. Rue, use your microphone because we're recording. Our cocktail of the day today is a mimosa. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers. And be nice with the hut officials when they come in. Right. Right. So cheers, Ray. So if any of you have listened to our podcast, we always start off with what I think has become the running joke of the podcast, which is an update on Tracks 203A. Because I feel like we've been talking about it for like 17 years. Michael Johnson is shaking his head because he's been involved in those working group conversations too. So but we always say there is no update. Except today there but is. But it looks like there's an update. Today there is, which is super exciting. I'm so excited that I have to actually read my notes to make sure I get this right. So on August 30th, HUD published a notice in the Federal Register, which was a 60-day notice of proposed information collection, and it was all of the forms that you guys use and that we talk about, that every time there's a tracks update, there's always forms that have to be updated. And so they put out this forms packet, but here's the fun fact. You know what they did, Rue? What? Oh. What? <laughs> she needs more practice. She needs more coffee, too. To go. We don't normally do this this early. I'm shy. She's not shy at all. Uh, so they put the forms packet out, but it wasn't the most recent version of the forms. Oh. Oh, so... Not surprising. Yeah, so this is going to be fun. Um, we have brought it to HUD's attention that this is not the most recent version of the draft forms. Um, the old forms are still out on their website, and this will be interesting to see what happens. Janelle, um, I did hear there was a Lanier sighting, so I wonder if the fact that Lanier's been back around lately, if some of this has to do with, with him being back around. It may be, because we've been kind of waiting to see what's, what's happening. Um, but the 60-day notice for comments is almost up, and that means if it does get through, we could start talking about development on Tracks 203A within the next 60 to 90 days. Um, but we'll see. Sure. Right? I, again, we'll see. That's kind of the running thing. We'll see. So comments are due next Monday, and we'll see what happens um, when we point out again that these are the wrong versions of the forms. So stay tuned. When we know, you'll know. That's right. So, look, I have a really important question. I want to know, is there anybody in the room that has any more ribbons on their badge than I do? <laughs> My, oh, okay. Okay. Yay! There's a contender. All right. That is awesome. Um, if you haven't read Ruse, there's one that says Troublemaker. I think uh, somebody picked that one and brought that just for her. Somebody knew her well. Uh, so when we started talking about content for this podcast, you know, what Rue and I do is we frequently talk about things that we're hearing in the industry, things that we're hearing talking with clients and other owner agents, and things that we hear at conferences because not everyone gets to get out and attend. And so we want to share whatever he we're hearing um, with all of our listeners. So we thought, what better thing to do than have people who are so heavily involved in the industry Tell us what, what's keeping them up at night. What are their biggest challenges? And when we asked you guys this question, none of you missed a beat. You immediately went, labor, it's labor, it's labor challenges. So I'm sure several of you in the audience can probably relate to that. And so with that, Anthony, uh, we're, we picked on you first because, you know, right. California. So 
And uh, Gwen actually brought this up yesterday talking about minimum wage, and I know that you've been watching that and curious to see what happens. So tell us a little bit about what is going on there. Yeah, in California, I always call it the uh, great socialist state of California because we seem to run by our own set of rules here. But um, minimum wage, like right now, the current minimum wage is based on the number of employees you have. So if you have less than 25, it's one rate. If you have more than, or it's actually 25. And then if you have um, 26 or more, it's another rate. State decide to change that next year where it doesn't matter how many employees you have, it's all gonna be the same rate, which is fifteen fifty an hour. Um, and I'm saying good luck trying to find someone for fifteen fifty an hour. But we also some of the other interesting that came up, uh, things that have come up in the state, we have a new law. Um, Assembly Bill 257, uh, and it's around the restaurants, the fast food industry, where there's been a commission set up by our great governor of the state um, that is doing a wage labor survey, and they've come down and, and decide right now, which there's going to be a lot of opposition against it, that the minimum wage for the fast food industry is going to be $22 an hour. So how's that going to impact every other industry? I mean, we talked about in a group, it's like, okay, do you understand in the affordable housing, one, we can't just pass these rates down to our residents. Our, our rents are set. Um, so to hire labor, which is very difficult to begin with, is, is going to make it that much more impossible. Um, there, was a, there were reports out right now, like in California, there are, there's, there's two jobs for every employee, two open positions right now for every employee. So we're all fighting for the same number of employees. So you try to ha high, you know, hire someone at you know, what you think is in your budget, you know, a reasonable rate, and they outcompete. I know um, we've all sat down. We, uh, it, I sit on a working group with other management companies. We all sit there and try to brain, you know, trust, you know, everything, you know, what we can possibly do to work th work this out. And one of them is like, you know, let's start hitting some of the um, technical schools and stuff like that. Try to train people from within. I know speaking with another management company, that's what they did. Spent a lot of money, you know, bring in these people, train them and stuff like that. Then once they got through that probationary period offered them a job. They offered them at $26 an hour, which was good rate of pay, like standard, you know, sort of what's going for a beginning maintenance person. The person came back and said, sorry, I'm not going to accept. I got another job for $30 an hour. So, I mean, that is some of the challenge that we deal with that I know Jennifer knows we're both in the same boat is uh, what do you do? Yeah. And so, Jennifer, you mentioned some things too. Um, tell us about San Francisco and their their leave, their paid leave. It's good stuff. So San Francisco is just extraordinarily expensive. And besides the high wages, um, there are all sorts of leave. So we do, we have COVID leave. We did have to add COVID leave um, in 2020, again in 2021 and 2022. So everyone is entitled to 80 hours of paid COVID leave. Um, and just recently, um, there's now new leave for public health emergencies. So for other public health emergencies like um, monkeypox or <laughs> perhaps the flu, I don't know, um, there's additional paid leave. So you have extraordinary wages, you have extraordinary amounts of paid leave. Um, at the cost of doing business there is just unbelievable. And then we have some local municipalities that are really concerned about worker protection and um, being, you know, providing more to people because they feel that not fair for folks to not always know their schedule. Um, so Berkeley is proposing to have penalty wages if you don't give your employees a full week's notice of their schedule changes. So if you have someone on, if you have to call someone in on call or someone's sick and you have to get someone to cover for them, you'd be paying a penalty rate um, of time and a half. Uh, so that's, that's a proposed law right now. So we spend a lot of time going to um, city council meetings and trying to influence um, to ensure that sort of, um, you know, not common sense uh, protections get enacted because they make it impossible for us to do business. I think that may be the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like the whole <laughs> penalty. Oh, I say that. Rue and I heard something crazy at another conference. But um, that one, uh, you know, a penalty for someone if you haven't published their schedule is, that's just crazy. I really don't know who thought that up and thought it was a good idea. So... Good luck with that one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Peter, on the other end 
uh, of the country. Tell me what's going on in your area in the Northeast. Yeah, so again, the, the staffing labor shortage issues are the same. I mean, we have, uh, you know, when we first, when did we talk? A couple, what, about three weeks ago, maybe? Uh, and I had said at that time we had 15% uh, of our positions open. I think we're now up to probably about 20%. Wow. And it's, it's crazy. Uh, you know, I don't know where people are hiding. I don't know where they went. Uh, you know, with unemployment down at this low percentage of what, about three and a half, just around three and a half percent. Um, like I said, I don't know where everybody went, but if, <laughs> and if anyone has any answers, let me know. I know we're all struggling with the same issues. Uh, but like I said, that the staffing positions, whether it be maintenance, property manager, uh, even admin people, we cannot find them uh, to come to work, as, as they say, for, for you know, a decent wage. Uh, and it's just, you know, I don't, like I said, it's hard to know where this turns. I mean, before the pandemic, we were coming into uh, low unemployment, right? In March of 2020, mm -hmm. just before. And uh, it's, like I said, you know, we're just in this crazy cycle I've never seen. Um, and I don't know where we go from here, but if anyone has answers as far as recruiting, whether it be from you know, we're looking at colleges. We've done virtual recruiting and, and just trying to do any networking you can. And I think even in yesterday's DEI information, you know, they said bringing women into the maintenance field. There are very few women in the maintenance field. Uh, but the, like I say, the staffing is really the, the biggest struggle for us. Yeah, and Peter, you said it wasn't just employees, you're having trouble finding contractors as yeah, well. Yeah, no. I, I mean, we've had jobs, uh, you know, I had uh, trying to find an architect actually down for a job in Groton, Connecticut. Had the guy lined up six months, six to eight months in advance, said couldn't take on the work, but he was, he would be ready in about six to eight months. And a month ago, he told us that he had a health issue and would not be able to take on the job. So I'm now back in the queue, and this is now, I think, year two and a half of trying to find an architect to just redo a clubhouse. Um, and so whether it be from, from architects to electricians, you name it, uh, the, the contractor's uh, availability um, is very limited, and the contractors I have are stretched because they have no employees. Yeah, so that's... You know, we talked a lot about staffing and wages and things like that, but you guys are also having trouble retaining current employees too. And one of the things that you guys talked about, and, and we've heard this as well, is complaints when gas prices are high about employees saying, well, I don't want to have to drive into work. It's costing me so much money. And you guys also talked about health insurance costs. Any of you want to elaborate on what you're seeing there? Yeah, I know um, we recently completed or actually just got our information for our 2023 year, which I was yelling at the broker. I'm like, come on. It's like, you know, we're getting near the open enrollment period. What are, what are the rates going to be? And California is typical, like your healthcare costs are going up between 10 to 15%. Um, you know, is that sustainable? I think that's, you know, when you look at your budget, and of course, you know, most of us know that you're getting budget approval well before November. So you're getting budget approval before you even have numbers to realistically look at to submit to your to your owners, lenders, and some other stuff like that. So you're you're proposing that. And that's like one of the numbers that always comes back is like, what are you guys gonna do? What what are you gonna offer this? And to be competitive in the industry is you can't push a lot of that cost back to the employee because they'll go somewhere else where it's 100% paid or or they pay their dependents, something other covers like that. So we're always looking at what we can do to streamline um, to make it more sense. I know one of the big things back for employees is, you know, what's it going to cost me? That's always, you know, I would say the whiff on what's in it for me. Um, fine, so you're going to get a, a lower, lower premium, but what's my copay going to be? You know, is my medicine going to be on the formula? You know, stuff like this is like, these are things where you say keep you up at night that you think about. It. It's like, I didn't know somewhere in my career I was going to have to become a healthcare benefit specialist, but guess what? That's what we get to do. So, so I think it's, you know, one, get educated on it, know what's going on, shop around. I mean, if you have an you know, option in California, um, maybe like some other states, so very big on HMO, the health maintenance organizations, which 
Um, good or bad, you know, um, depending on your health care, I always say it's a great plan if you're healthy. Um, if you have some health issues, maybe not so great. Um, but, but I think those are things that you just have to look at as an employer, sort of try to think out of the box. I think, again, I go back to a little bit on um, being part of this working group. We get to express sort of what's going on and feel like, you know, we all know each other and, and we're going to share the information and sort of see, you know, what, what other people are going through. And one of the other things that we talked about, you know, for a while during, right after the pandemic, there was, you know, the great resignation. And now the, the term that we're hearing now is quiet quitting. So tell me what you're seeing there with your staff as well. Well, any of you. Yeah, um, sort of uh, one of the things that uh, we did recently is, that, you know, you try to think outside the box. So we started doing a, we hired a third party to do an employee engagement survey to find out sort of what is going on, what do they feel, what are things that are keeping them up at night? You know, what are things they're, they're thinking about? And get their, get their honest feedback. We did actually a pretty good job promoting it. We had, actually had 66% of our employees participate in the survey, which is much better than last year, much better than they consider the industry standard. But the, what, what they found out on the, on the quiet quitting is what you're hearing is so, um, one of the big things is for maintenance people, uh, you know, the standby or the after hours or the callbacks and stuff like that, where feedback from a lot of maintenance were like, I'm on 24-7. What can you guys do to help me? It's like, I don't feel I can have a life outside of work. This is not realistic. You know, a lot of people talk about the work-life balance and, and things like that. So we we sort of push back, sort of like, you know, let's think about this. What, what can we do? Um, because what we're hearing from is like, oh, well, there's a sister property close by. We'll pull them in, ask them if they're willing to, you know, share like a weekend or something like that. Nope, not going to do it. Mm-mm. You know, and it's like I value my job, but I don't feel this is part of my job description per se. And I'm like, well, isn't there that like number 18 or 30 that says in all other related jobs? But, but um, you know, it's it's it doesn't fly unfortunately. But but it, it is something that you you have to think about. It's like, okay, what can we do to get them engaged? How do you incentivize them to want to do this? Um, and we're in the process right now of looking into that, so we don't have the quiet quitting. Yeah. That just amazes me. I don't know about you guys, but I can't imagine if my boss said, hey, could, I need you to do this. Make one. Yeah, I'm not feeling it. Sorry. Um, it really wouldn't, it wouldn't go over so well. I can, I can tell you that. Um, so one of the things that we talked about, and I was so busy taking notes during our prep call, I forgot which one of you said it, but you talked about filling gaps in your workforce with after hours contact centers. Jennifer, or Peter, have you guys tried that? No. Okay, it's Anthony it again. Probably me again. <laughs> okay. um, it, it's, it's thinking outside the box. So we actually looked at a company that um, not only like um, your after hours calls, but they could actually facilitate in some of the some of the maintenance things. They sort of have a drawback on that, just so you guys know my background. Predominantly, our properties are senior properties. So I had to tell them, I'm like, um, if I try to tell a senior how to plunge the toilet, they're probably going to tell me something not so nice because um, they don't. They don't want to do that. I'm in family property is a little bit different, but we're trying to work with that to see um, because it's uh, what they do is you call the after hours call and they're like, what's the issue? You know, most of the time it's like clogged toilet or something leaking or the air conditioning not working the way it should. Um, walk them through some of the basic things on how to, how they can fix it themselves. You know, is this an absolute emergency? You know, is the, is their apartment on fire? You know, is there something like that going on? And try to help some of those because those are some things that our residents get frustrated about because they're not the emergencies, the on fires that, you know, we're like, well, um, can you turn off the water like in the back and stuff like that that might help out versus having a plumber or the maintenance person come back and do that. Yep. All right, I'm going to ask you to pass that down to Rue. So one of the things that Rue and I have heard and we've adopted the, or we're talking about adopting this is, you know, for that work-life balance and people are saying, oh, I need some time off. But one of the strategies we heard was take every federal holiday that you can right? To give them that time off and then you're not going, well, why did I get this holiday and not the other one? It's really kind of a, a pretty easy thing to do to just take every federal holiday and then we do a little something extra at Resmond too. We do Resmond days and we get to take off, uh, we do a long weekend, we add an extra day on the four day or the three day weekend. So every 
Every Memorial Day, every 4th of July, every Labor Day, we get the Friday before off. And so everybody feels like it's a little bit special and it really is not a big thing for the company to do something like that. And the reason why I was caught off guard is because what I was thinking in my mind was, I've read a couple articles recently that actually says that the issues that you're dealing with right now as far as staffing, cha uh, staffing challenges are not gonna go away. Well, because that was, people, that was wonderful news early in the morning, I'm sure. People, <laughs> but people are driving Ubers and they're out there making their own hours and determining how much money they're going to make and they're not going to go away. So we really do have to find ways to, to handle these challenges with what we have. Yeah, that's... I know that's depressing for early in the morning. That is a little depressing. Um, and I know, you know, Peter, you said with your staffing shortages that you have, you know, your regionals are having to fill in now where you have um, shortages on property. Right. So we have, again, and I know others have this as well, is basically a portfolio manager filling in as the property manager because I just don't have the staff for the person. And you need somebody in that office. Um, and so they're, they're attending to, you know, property manager needs, not necessarily doing their regional or portfolio manager needs. And so you're, you're losing, I'll say, ground on all of it. Uh, and, and then the other piece, again, for the, the, that dovetails on the back end is your existing staff that you're using to cover the empty vacancies are, are stressed because you're, you're maximizing, uh, I'll call it, or asking to use their 110% potential to cover the issues, and they're stressed out. Uh, and so their, their mental health and well-being is, is taking a toll. Um, and so again, just trying to balance all the uh, business pieces that need to be kept running uh, is, is, like I say, the struggle is real and it's going to continue and I don't know what the end in sight is. I had another flash of inspiration. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I'm old, but when I was in high school, there were work programs. Are they still doing that in high school now? Do y'all know? So remember, you could go to school for a couple of hours and then you would leave and actually go to a job and you would get school credit and you would start working. So I don't know, would that be something that you could maybe consider looking into with your high school and seeing if they're still doing that? And I mean, I know that that's not, you know, on the job ready, but it's at least a way to train them and get them started up the career path. That's a good suggestion. I think they now call it community service at the, at the high schools. Um, you're aging. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's a cool idea, Rue. Um, I, I think it's a cool it. idea. You just you have to deal with the confidentiality issues, sure. and you know, like only probably your top students would be able to step into those roles. But I also have another um, like quasi solution I just want to share. So we also, of course, have a lot of staffing challenges and vacant positions, and the on-site positions have been so hard in the past year after the um, the worst of the pandemic and uh, social civil unrest and you know, just the stress that people were under. And um, we created a position we call property operations specialist, and we pay the, these people who are in this role, we pay them more than we pay an on-site manager, but less than we pay a regional manager. And basically they just fill in for operational needs. So if you have properties that are in close enough proximity to each other, um, you can really, it can make a lot of sense dollar-wise, and you can sort of dispatch them where you have a need. So we have um, one property operations specialist who's really skilled at our accounting software, and we have dispatched him to so many properties where there were vacancies to do all of the um, bookkeeping and accounting, you know, to do all the posting of payments and um, run reports and stuff like that. So that's one way that we have been able to fill a gap. And then that's a, it's a project eligible expense. So that all gets charged back to the property. It's not corporate load. There's just a tiny about tiny bit that we carry corporately, which covers their, um, their paid vacation, sick leave, stuff like that. Well, good job you guys being creative and how you're recruiting and how you're retaining employees because it's hard enough to get them, but then you need to keep them once you get them in the door. So switching topics, the other thing that was a, seemed to be kind of a hot topic was rent control and eviction moratoriums and the impact that that's having on your businesses. So I was surprised to hear that you guys are still seeing residents that aren't paying their rent. And 
Tell me what you're doing about that. <laughs> Where do you well, want to start? We Tell asked me. him very nicely. Will you please pay your rent? Right. Because I can't pay my employees if you don't pay your rent. So in the county of Alameda, there's still an eviction moratorium. That's where Oakland is. Um, that's where Berkeley is. And it is a flipping nightmare because we have people, we literally have some residents who have not paid rent since March of 2020. We have new lease up buildings where we cannot convert our loans because after people moved in, they just don't pay. It's nuts. So we're desperate to have the, re the um, remedies back that we used to have to compel people to pay their rent when they weren't doing the right thing. Sorry for such sad news. Jennifer, I get to commiserate on this stuff together, but um, fortunately, uh, doing a lot of senior properties, majority of our residents did pay the rent. Um, we had some that didn't, uh, same thing like that. And we're starting to see um, some of the eviction moratoriums start lifting. It's California, so some things were ahead, some things were way behind on. But there, you know, it's just following up the same thing as sort of like uh, in the cases, you know, like we said, we asked nicely. Um, I know there were some great ideas, I think, that came up in the affiliates meeting yesterday, which I thought was interesting, is that I heard someone saying, oh, well, you're going to 1099 the, the residents for their unpaid portion of rent as income. Well, it's like, I want to find out how that goes. Um, but uh, it, it's just, I think it's just gradual, the same thing. You just have to try every little thing you can. It's interesting when you, when Jennifer mentions, I saw Amber's jaw drop. You mean people haven't paid their rent in like two years? I go, yeah, welcome to our world where you also get to see them drive up in a new Tesla um, or have their Amazon deliveries with their big screen televisions and stuff like that. Can't do anything about it. Um, you just have to sit there. And the management, you know, that's the thing is the managers get very frustrated. But it's like, let's look at the end goal. We're going to get through this. It's going to be good. Um, you know, the residents that move on for whatever reason, that's fine. They'll move on. We'll replace them with, you know, the ones that, that will pay the rent. But I think it's, it's I'm starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, I think, which is a good thing. Um, but mm, not quite there yet. So I'll just add to the evictions as far as, again, working with the attorneys to, to uh, you know, get the folks to pay their rent. But, but on the other side, we also have those for, for cause where we, you know, we've had several cases where we've had residents with knives chasing the contractor out of the building. Um, and that's on video. Um, and again, having to go after that resident for, uh, you know, attacking the contractor. Um, so again, as you're trying to just keep, uh, I'll say, operations running at, at uh, what I would call a level a keel is, is difficult. Um, and, but at the same time, those that have uh, previously been served uh, eviction notices that I'm seeing those folks two and three times over. The same, it's the same residents that do not pay the rent. Um, and you're in this constant battle. And so, you know, you get into court, you're there with, with the judge, and the judge wants you to go to mediation and, and do uh, try and work with their, um, trying to, what's the name of the uh, tap, the, the mediation services with the court. And so, you know, they'll, they will get involved with the resident. But again, the resident even defies them and says, I'm not listening to you. And so then you're back before the judge. But it's, it's a good six to eight months, if not longer, before you gain possession of that unit. It's very difficult. Yikes. Well, I just want to say most of our residents do actually pay. I, I don't want to just share the bad. Um, you know, most of the properties somewhere between 80 and 90 percent pay, but, you know, 10 to 20 percent is a lot. Um, and, you know, there are residents who have forty, fifty thousand dollar $50,000 delinquency um, balances, and we are just, you know, our hands are tied. Um, we also have, uh, in San Francisco, there is, a f there is um, representation for all, and um, our residents are entitled to legal representation by the city. And so the way they approach an eviction, and this was post-pandemic as well, or I'm sorry, pre-pandemic, before the pandemic, the way they would approach an eviction is that, um, you know, if we started an action because someone was, say, six months behind in their rent, because that's usually about how long it would take before we would go there because of the process involved. Um, they would be represented and we would be served with, you know, 48 interrogatories that we have to answer. Our staff would be deposed 
they would bring every possible defense, um, habitability, um, unclean hands, everything you can think of against us. And most often those end up being jury trials. So um, you can ask for a jury trial for your eviction. And um, so it's quite a process. That's the first time I've heard about the jury trial for eviction. That, uh, wow. I mean, how do you, wow, wow. And you hope all the people on the jury are paying their rent. I'm just saying. I know jury of your peers just got a little scary. <laughs> wow. So rent control. Peter, you were talking about um, some hardships that come along with that and some challenges. Yeah, so in, in, in Massachusetts, rent control is at least back on as a discussion item with the, with, uh, the current uh, city, the mayor of Boston, as well as with the legislature. And I don't know what's going to happen, but again, it has, you know, it continues to, I'll, I'll say, raise its head in uh, places across the nation. Um, and you're seeing it try to make a movement. And I don't know what's going to happen. My guess is, you know, I talked to someone else and they said, probably go to a referendum in 2024 and see what, what the people say for Massachusetts. But we know that it doesn't work, um, but yet there are some, I'll call it politicians and, and legislative folks. Again, as you see prices out of control, whether you look at your insurance rates that are going up, your premium insurance for general liability, whether you look at your utility rates that are going through the roof at 62% uh, across the board. And so, you know, when you're getting limited to your OCAF increase on your, on your budgets, um, we're, we're never going to make it. We're doomed. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in California, um, you know, just because of that, um, we do have rent control. Fortunately, uh, AMA PSW was able to argue the point and carve out affordable housing. So affordable housing doesn't fall under that realm, but there are still limits because sometimes a housing authority, if you have a voucher or something like that, will put in limits. Right now uh, in California, the, the law is it's 5% it's plus your local um, CPI. Um, I know in Los Angeles, we just did the calculation. It's still a 10% um, rate increase that you could give if, you're, if you fall under that. But does that cover your cost? You know, we talk about like things going up and in California, not only are we dealing with labor issues and high costs and other stuff like that, but we're in like a thousand year drought. So the big thing is water conservation. And to the point where there's bills on there that they're gonna have you start tracking as, as a management agent or something like that, the use of water of your residents, you know, and how you're going to do this and give all this information and what are they going to do with that information? What, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just all, you know, on top of everything else It's just more and more work that they're asking from, from us, you know, every day. And you're just like, Oh, okay. I'm in this for why? So Peter, you talked about too, that there's additional reporting requirements that you guys are having to go through. And then you also mentioned you're seeing families come through, you know, two or three times asking for emergency assistance as well. Yes. On, on the rental assistance. Right. So yeah. again, they're, they're back in court, you know, we've had them in court one, two, three times again, still getting that, uh, whether it be the emergency raft assistance, the raft assistance, it was Shira before that. And, you know, Again, difficult to say when that pot of money is gonna run out. Uh, again, it's it's not an endless stream, um, and you know, again, the I'll say the future really needs to I'll, I'll say for our government to come back. I think at least bring back the I'll call it the Section Eight program and put in funding so that you know that these people, at least if you're giving them, I'll, I'll say that where they're paying thirty percent of their adjusted income you know, they've, they've got a good chance. Uh, but again, where we're not doing that, but yet we are on one hand on the vouchers. At the same time, uh, I, I do believe that somehow we need to put in, I'll call it financial literacy for these families to try and help them because they're not even able to balance their checkbook. Like I said, the, the needs that, you know, again, they go out and buy that car without even the thought of, of how are they going to pay the rent next month? Um, and that's a real problem. And I, I, again, the only way I think you can change that is by having one-on-one -on -one conversations with those family members. But even then, I'm not sure 
what will shift gears, but that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Jennifer, you and Anthony also uh, brought up management fees when we were having our discussion, and you were talking about caps on management fees and yeah, don't accept them, please. So um, we, we've definitely seen a lot of underwriters trying to tell us what our management fees should be, and that is just not acceptable. They have no idea what our costs are, and we cannot, as an industry, we have to fight back against that. So we have had, um, in, in recent times, we've also had um, a state agency that told us that our, our fees would be limited to a certain number for our permanent supportive housing units. And so I did draft a letter um, to our client and said, that's fine, we will not manage your property um, because this is the fee we need to manage your property. And they did, um, they shared that with the state agency and they lifted their cap. So um, you should not accept fees that don't cover your costs. And that's, that's what our, uh, our position is and we hope that you will join us in it. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting when you talk about, you know, taking a position and pushing back on that. And Anthony, you mentioned, you know, a minute ago, I'm a PSW. So when you're running into issues like this, you know, we talk about grassroots advocacy with, with NAMA. Are you utilizing those channels? How is, how can you make that work for you to help you with these issues? Yeah, we have, um, we, we have a representative that, um, we have a legs and regs committee that's pretty active. And I know we, we work with all my NCH because they use the same consultant that goes up there. And one makes us aware of all the, all the bills. Um, in California, there are every, well, our ledges, our legal session every year, uh, at the beginning of the legal sessions, there's probably about 2,000 bills that are started. Um, I don't know, RSH is big on law for whatever reason. Um, and we, we tried to drill down. It's like, what affects us? You know, what affects housing? And there's always something that affects housing because even if it's not specifically housing, so it's labor or some other stuff like that, it's just knowing what is going on. And then we determine um, part of our legs and regs on all the PSW, what are the bills we're going to fight? Because I think like all other Amas, we're volunteers. We have paid other jobs, but this is like really critical that we follow. And like I, I was saying yesterday, you know, find your passion, go after it. This is what affects your business. And I think um, we we drill down to the ones we we think we can like fight and get a hold of someone. Um, we will join with Ama NCH and go up to Sacramento if we have to, and and or write a statement on you know really the, you know this is where you're going. It's like, do you really want to chase business out of the state? Because you will. Um, and uh, I mean, I'd like to say we're, we're um, hurt all the time. I can't say that, but I think we are hurt now, which is great. I think they know who we are. Uh, and I think that's the biggest difference is having that representation so you know who to speak to when something comes up and say, how does, how does this affect us? And we can't continue to do business this way. And I think that's what's really helped. Uh, yeah, I want to second that. So in addition to, so this year we didn't do, um, I didn't do hill visits this year, but have always done them in the past. Um, but our NAMA um, makes an effort to meet with our legislators in the state. And um, not our, not our uh, federal legislators, but our state legislators. And um, I know I got invited to meet with my state representative in San Francisco on behalf of the association and that other um, members and board members got to do the same. And we really put, you know, a, a face to affordable housing. And when they know us, we, we offer to be a subject matter expert for them. And when they know us, they pay attention when we reach out to them about a pending issue, which is absolutely necessary in our state. And I, I think it's really necessary in a lot of places and hope that you guys will take advantage of those opportunities to talk to your, your, home, uh, your home legislators so that you uh, don't follow the way of California. <laughs> well, and along those lines, one of the tips that, that we've heard too at other conferences is it's it's sometimes hard to get in now on the Hill to see people or to catch them there. And they said, you know, be aware of their schedules and when they're home, uh, particularly if they're home campaigning or on a break or whatever, that we're hearing that people are having more luck visiting them in their local offices than they are up in the Hill. So something to consider. Or inviting them as your special guest to an event at a property. That is 
what I found is I've been the most rewarding is actually reaching out to your local people and have them come see what you do. They like that. Their staff like that. I know Alma hosted, like, um, I think we had, like, I know at least one property that we had them come to and we had the legislator come and, and see what we do. And what's actually a really big plug is, and I know Chris would probably like this, is promoting your COQ, your communities of quality, and let them know this is what we focus on as an industry. We we set the standard, um, and this is why it's so important. And, and the quality that we provide to these residents and what is, you know, an absolute need, um, it's really important to do that. And a lot of them don't know that. I mean, they don't know what we do. They don't, um, you know, understand or they think something that's different. And then, you know, the light goes on when they see it, and they're like, hmm, maybe, maybe I should listen to them when they have something to say. That's fantastic. So I know we talked, you know, about some topics that were seem a little bit gloom and doom. We talked about rising costs and how it's hard to find labor and challenges that you guys are having. But we talked about some other things that are working and we talked about specifically vouchers and tax credit properties. Would you want to expand on that? Section 8 vouchers? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly if you can get a voucher holder at a tax credit property, um, there's an opportunity to uh, receive more income for that unit um, because you can, you are not penalized for being tax credit. Your housing authority has to pay the same rate they would pay to your neighbor next door who's market rate. Um, so you are able to receive funds above the tax credit limit. Um, for that unit. I, I think um, we definitely, and WSH takes advantage of that, but one of the other things we look at with the housing authorities, they issue a payment standard. Um, and a lot of times what they'll try to do is compare your affordable tax credit unit to to the, mar to the market rate and try to give you, okay, well, your tax credit is this, we're going to pay you that. No, they have to pay the payment standard. I think that's working with the housing authorities, educating them on that. A lot of them, as let, you know, we talk about, you know, they don't understand what their even their own rulings are. Um, so a lot of times it's like, you know, I always say we just have to become better players at the game. And I'll just add to that again, if they are great, they do fill a spot, but it is also having to battle as Anthony just said, with the housing authority, because if you have a voucher holder that's been in your property for five years, and then you have a new person coming in today, uh, you know, the previous voucher did not keep up with the payment standard, and then you can't get the housing authority to meet what is the current payment standard without putting that family through anguish, saying you have to terminate their voucher first, uh, giving them notice that they may have to move out, putting them through all, all sorts of issues as far as them thinking that they're homeless and not and they're not but because the housing authority won't bring that payment standard up on the existing tenant it, it is a battle to get them and again as Anthony says if they would just understand their own rules it, it would be a smooth process but it's not an easy battle out there as you can see um well watching our time here and before we wrap up does anyone have questions for our panelists um basically I have a question about staffing um, do you envision that at some point in time you're going to go back to a centralized accounting operation where your rents are going to be all centralized in your office and at some point maybe payables? For the future, probably. Um, again, as you're trying to help, uh, whether it be a property manager that's in place or an admin person that's in place, there's only so much time in a day and, and uh, they don't have time already to do everything. And so as you try and get, uh, I'll say, streamlined efficiencies in that office to help, I, I think the only way that's going to happen is some of that stuff is going to have to come back in, in a central office type processing. Sorry, uh, a little bit of a different thought on that. I'm a third party operator, so of course, if I take it in house, that's my cost um, versus now is at the property level. So I, and I've done an analysis of this because I looked at it like early on a little bit of my financial accounting background. What is the most efficient way for me as, a, as an operator to, to do this? And it is like in the field. So one of the things I do is leverage technology, um, you know, as much as possible. How can I make it easier for them? I mean, there's you know, how do I facilitate the residents during their online payments? You know, great. They pay call, make all their rents online. 
I don't have people having to process everything and, and do all that. So how do I incentivize them more of that so we are collecting all the rents on the first? Um, the same thing a little bit with the with the payables. We leverage the technology. We're using it right now with, give a little plug to Mark here, uh, Rent Cafe is their, their payables process here is that um, the payables are going to, to Yardi. Um, and their, their process, it's still a little bit of process because, you know, sometimes like how they code it or how they approve it or stuff like that. But the majority of the recurring payables are not going through the property anymore. They're going off site. They're going through yard. They're getting processed. The manager still has to approve it and see everything going on, but they're not, you know, having to scan it, do, do everything else like that. So my, my recommendation is leverage the technology as much as possible because um, when you sit back and you ask your staff, um, you know, one of the things we found out through our employee engagement survey is can you list all the jobs that you do? And I would say as a resident manager, probably 25 or 30 jobs. Um, and the most important is I tell people, we are customer service. So what do you need to, what's your most important thing? It's the residents. So, you know, a resident wants to come in and talk with you understand that, you know, you try to get them in your schedule, but you have to manage it too, because that's one of the things is a lot of our managers being people, people, um, will sit there and let the resident go on for an hour, an hour and a half. It's like, you know, you can let them know the timeline and, and all the things you need to get, you need to get done. And one of the other things I really stress going back to technology is using your outlook, using your calendar, using planning ahead. You know when, what, one of the things you don't know is what you don't know. You can't plan for an emergency. And I always tell them 90% of the time, when is emergency gonna happen? Not Monday through Friday, nine to five. It's gonna happen after that. So during that time, focus on what you can. So when that emergency does come up, you can deal with it and it doesn't stress you out and do that. And I, I think the same thing is, spending the time with your employees um, on training. Um, we do something different with our company. Um, we do like a, a social styles profile, emotional intelligence to sort of see what is this person's uh, communication style? What drives them? What does that? And you know, how's it gonna help them? And how do they work with other styles? So, so um, it has helped people like in the communication process, um, you know, understand you know, when a resident comes in, you know, upset and fired up, how do I deal with them? You know, usually pushing them off is not a good thing because, you know, you're going to hear from them or they're going to blow up even more. But I think it's training, spending your time training on that. And I always say, you know, we have to learn to become better players at this game. And, and I think we all have the staff. They're smart enough to do it. Leverage the, you know, what's out there so we can, we can make their jobs easier. Yeah, I'd like to go back to what Doreen said about centralizing of accounting functions. About 35 years ago when I took over as CEO of my family's management company in South Dakota, coming from a completely different background, I immediately pulled all certification work and all paperwork from my on-site staff and centralized it. To this day, that is how they do it on their tax credit properties, their rural development and their HUD. It is very efficient. You can go with mass recertification dates so that you have your, your in-house in staff working year-round. I'm currently working on a proposal for another management company of similar size to do this sort of thing. And I hadn't thought about it in terms of the staffing issue, but it certainly is that. So the property managers are doing property management, not doing any paperwork whatsoever. It works very well. And I also had a very large company that is a member of NAMA just float that to me once and I said, well, man, I did that 35 years ago. And I always wonder why some of the larger companies don't think about that. The idea of having to hire these people on site that are experts in everything is just utterly amazing to me. And I think Doreen is making a very visionary comment in saying that it's not just accounting. Uh, it, it, it can work very well. So thank you for bringing that up. Have you, anyone had any success uh, hiring our residents, even our seniors, in some for staffing? We've had residents apply, and just like anything else, you accept you know any qualified applicant to come through. One of the things that comes up is usually a concern is the privacy because they're going to know information about their neighbor next door. Um, so we have to disclose that to them and, and just understand you know the privacy and everything stays within that office. Um, Dealing with like um, the senior population, um, we've usually found more qualified candidates than than our than than our residents, our current residents. Um, but we did have recently. We had a 
person at one of our family deals apply for the maintenance position and we actually did hire him um you know um he doesn't have access to you know resident income and all the other stuff so it wasn't that wasn't much much of an issue but um get back to gwen's point on on centralized compliance that we are centralized um so our accounting and some of the other functions were not um but for compliance we've always because because i think that is um our company runs off vital factors and compliance is one of our vital factors so that's in-house because i want control of things i can control we are um, obligated under section three at some of our properties however we always try to place residents at a property they don't live at so we manage enough properties within the region that we can do that we feel like that's really important not just uh, we think that's important to their success because their neighbors have a certain perception of them and don't generally see them as being now part of the management team or having any authority or knowledge or skill to be their maintenance person. Um, and so we feel like it's better for the, the, re, the resident's success as well in their new employment to have them placed somewhere else. It's good to be among this company and be in the same boat with all of you all, but it doesn't really make me feel better, but I'm happy to be <laughs> among the, the giants in the same boat. I'm curious if anyone's tried AI to solve any staffing problems. We have no robot managers. Um, we have ex we have explored um, we have explored the robot security guards. I don't know if you guys have seen them. They're a thing in my neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, they don't do well with vandalism, so they're not really that effective for multifamily housing. But um, we do certainly try to use um, some types of technology to handle things that residents need. Um, we're, my company's a little behind on that front. We're big and we move kind of slow. So um, we're you know, just in the process of changing some of our software to give residents who've never had access online you know, an online portal where they can place their work orders and they can um, communicate with management and pay their rent and see their ledger and do their recertification and things of that nature. We do have, um, we do have online application process and we were required to use a portal where all applicants apply um, for anything that has city funding. Some of our counties have the same requirement. And so that's all electronic and that does prevent uh, the need for big leasing staff to handle new projects, but we're not, there yet with uh, with other um, other roles. And I'll just end with uh, yes, we have or, or continue to try and look at all of those items. In particular, uh, security is one um, where we use a company. I'll do the plug for Watchtower. Um, so we put them in. Actually, has been extremely helpful on a property where you don't have it, it's really a 24 seven surveillance basically. And so for this property in particular, we've had a flooding issue. And so with the cameras there at the property, we've been able to identify where that water is coming from into the building, which we would not otherwise had. Um, and so it has worked out extremely well. And, and so, yeah, we'll continue to look at other pieces to be able to do wherever you can. I think it is going to the be the next add-in, so to speak, of just trying to, again, improve efficiencies wherever you can. Yep. Um, all right, well, we are at time, but really quickly, Rue, what upcoming events will we be attending? Well, first and foremost tonight, the Education Foundation Gala. There are still tickets available, and there are ways to donate and uh, Sign up on Give Smart so you can participate in the auction. First 30 people get these super cool paddles that are special. So get out there, put your information in, go out and start making bids. The silent auction's already live. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see everybody tonight. It's going to be amazing. Then we're going to be at Mid Atlantic Alma in the middle of November. Yeah. 
And that's all of our events for the year. Woohoo! I know. I we we might actually be home for a week or so. That'd be awesome. Um, well, I want to thank all of you, Jennifer, Anthony, Peter. Thank you. I'm going to want to hear about your upcoming events too, but we can talk about that after because uh, I'm sure Peter's <laughs> off somewhere fabulous soon. Uh, but thank you so much for being here and for sharing your experiences and what your challenges are and what you're doing to overcome that. And I'm, I'm sure the audience liked hearing that as well. Um, you, Please, if you're not connected to Rue and I on LinkedIn, um, please connect with us. We post updates uh, as we get information in between podcasts and webinars and travels and all that goodness. Um, you can find our Cocktails and Compliance podcast on Spotify and Apple something. I don't know. I use Spotify. But wherever you get, wherever you get your podcast contact, <laughs> you can find us there. And we just appreciate you all again and come have a cocktail with us at the gala tonight. Well, and I just have one last thing to add, because even though we are sitting at NAMA and it's a live audience, for the people who are listening to this online and they're not at NAMA, the things that we talked about today are the reasons why it's important to be here and Absolutely. to take part in NAMA, because they represent your issues at the state and government level. So everybody get out there, come to a meeting, see what it's about, and join. Thank you Thanks, again. guys. We'll see you all.